So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb where Lazarus was buried. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Well, in John chapter 12, the Bible tells us that Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So Jesus had already raised Lazarus from the dead before he rode into Jerusalem. And then on the next day, the crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet him. And they began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So they were crowning him king. They wanted a redeemer, not from sin, but from the Romans. Jesus finding a young donkey, he sat on it, as it is written, and this was prophesied, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, many of us know the story of Palm Sunday, and that's basically it. But I want to go back to that great event that took place a little earlier with the raising of Lazarus, because it brings to us a very important question, and I think it's a question that every one of us in this room and everybody watching online needs to answer. And here's the question. What makes a better life? Freedom or bondage? What's a better way to live? Being free or being in some kind of bondage? Now, we probably say, oh, being free. But I wonder if we're willing to do what's required in order to be free. I think there are more of you here today who want to live life to the fullest, be free from the things that kind of you know, rob us of life. We don't want to be held down by things. You know, bondage is anything that just traps you and holds you down and entangles you. That's a bondage. We're in a little mini-series entitled The Sayings of Jesus. And we're going to hear him say something that was life-changing for Lazarus. And uh, it could be life-changing for you and me as well, if we really listen carefully. Now, for Lazarus, it was a very dismal situation. It was dark. It was cold. He was beyond help. He was without hope. Why? Because he died. And he was already buried in a tomb. So here's what happened. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were dear friends of Jesus. He would often stay at their home, teaching them, enjoying meals with them. And one day Lazarus became sick, but Jesus was out of town. So they sent word to him to please come, hurry up, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus arrived four days later, after Lazarus had already died and been buried in a tomb. Well, Jesus finally arrives and he says, take me to him. And we pick it up in John chapter 11 
in verse 38. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, he came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Open the entrance. And Martha, the sister of Lazarus, she said, oh, Lord, no. no. By this time, there'll be a stench. But he's been, he's, he's been dead four days. Oh, man, we don't want to open that door now. But Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe? Man, I wonder how many circumstances in our personal lives it would be good to apply that little phrase, if you believe. There are some things that some of you are going through right now, and it's really hard and difficult. And you know what can help you? If you believe. If you believe that God is with you. I'm not saying believe it's going to go the way you want it to go. I'm just saying believe that God is with you in that thing. He said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Oh, man. In other words, God moves. What's the glory of God? The glory of God is when God moves and people see something happening and they know it's God. That only God can do certain things that man can't do. God can do a lot of things that man can't do. So he says, that's why we have to believe, we have to have faith that God will move in a given situation. So in verse 41, they removed the stone. And then Jesus raised his eyes and he prayed. It's a prayer. Whenever you talk to God the Father, that's called prayer. He said, Father, oh, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it. So that they may believe that you sent me. See, Jesus could have prayed in his heart, and God the Father would have heard him. But rather, he prays overtly, outwardly. Why? So the people would believe. So the people would believe that Jesus is who he said he was. So when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Guess what happened? Lazarus came forth. In verse 44, the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Now, he's all wrapped up like a mummy, but he's walking somehow out of that tomb. Can't really see where he's going. But wait, up until this time, Lazarus, even though Jesus raised him. Lazarus is still not ready to live life. Especially, he's not ready to live life to the fullest. Sure, he was raised from the dead. He's alive. He walked out of the tomb. But he's still bound with the grave clothes. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. In other words, take off the grave clothes. He's not ready to live until you take off the grave clothes. And I ask you, what kind of life would Lazarus have lived if he didn't take off the grave clothes? If he stayed in those linen wrappings and just went back to life, well, he'd probably walk very slowly everywhere he went because he was all wrapped up living the rest of his life. He couldn't eat. Wouldn't be able to eat. Why? Because his head was all wrapped in linen wrappings. He'd have no freedom because he was still bound hand and feet. Though he was alive, he was still bound. So when Jesus raised him from the dead, you know he wasn't finished yet? He wasn't done with Lazarus. Just because Lazarus was raised from the dead doesn't mean Jesus was done. He had to set him free. 
so he could live life to the fullest. Now I want to take this scene and I want to make it personal. Most of you, if not all of you, have been raised from spiritual death. Spiritual death. You have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. There may be a few here who have not. We want you to know that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten, his only begotten son that whoever, that's you, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So you can be set free. You can be free in Christ. You can have eternal life. So you've been raised from spiritual death. You received Christ as your Savior. He's given you new life. All of us at least are at that place right now. But like Lazarus, that's not all there is to it. If you want to live life to the fullest, you know what you have to do? You have to take off the grave clothes. You got to get them off. And if you don't take them off, you'll never live life to the fullest, though you've been raised from spiritual death, and yeah, you're going to heaven. Today we're talking about living life on the earth. The question today is, do you want to take off your grave clothes or spend the rest of your life walking around in rags and in bondage? Do you want to stay in that thing that's got you bound. And you know if you do, because every once in a while it pops up and it gets a hold of you and it robs your freedom. It robs your free will. It makes you do things you don't want to do. And it stops you from doing things that you want to do. That's what the grave clothes do. I want to give you today three aspects of why we take off the grave clothes after salvation. Number one, so we can walk in newness of life. See, God's plan for us is not just to get us to heaven. God's plan for us is to get us to live such a way that while we're on the earth, we live for Christ and we reveal Christ to the world. The Bible says in Romans 6 verse 4, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We have a brand new life because God has made us a brand new creation. See, the old bondages, the old way of life, removed. God has established for us a brand new way of life. In verse 5, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's the good news. We will be raised with Christ. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old self, who we were before salvation, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin or live in bondage. That that thing in your life, maybe there's two, maybe there's three, oh God forbid, maybe there's four, would not control you, would not manipulate you and master you, but that you would be free. And you know, with Lazarus, it was like, no, man, you're going to take off all the grave clothes, not just some. Well, don't just unwrap his feet and his legs, but he can't use his arms and he can't see where he's going. And don't just unwrap his head where his arms are still in bondage and his feet are still trapped. No, man, they all have to go. Lazarus, if you're going to live life to the fullest, all the grave clothes have to go. And people of God... If we're going to live life to the fullest, all the grave clothes have to go. All of them. The second thing I want us to say is that the grave clothes are corrupted. 
Man, it's like wearing stinky, rotten rags. Anybody here get up this morning and put on stinky, rotten rags? No, you all look so beautiful, fashionable. You all look so good, right? But did you ever put on wet clothes? It's like, ugh, you know? Imagine wet clothes that smelled and that were dirty. You'd be like, ugh, nobody wants that, right? Well, the grave clothes are corrupted. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 21, he said, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, once again, before salvation, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. What's Paul saying? Take off the grave clothes. Don't receive Jesus as your savior, but stay in bondage and wear those raggedy old grave clothes the rest of your life. No, man, get rid of them. Take them off. Because going through life with wet, smelly clothes is not comfortable. And it's not fun. And you know what? <laughs> Nobody wants to be around you. You wear smelly, wet clothes. Nobody wants to be around you. Take them off. Why? Because he said they're being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of the sea. The word corrupted means shriveling up, withering away. In other words, they're just like rotting. They're corrupting. You know, they're not getting any better. The old grave clothes never get better. They get worse with time. They never get better. Paul said in Romans 13, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing, drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. See, these are all troublemaker actions. These are the things that get you in trouble. You want to get in trouble? Go carousing, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity. You'll get in trouble. Sensuality, strife, jealousy. That'll get you in trouble. You see, the old self likes these things. The sin nature loves those things. But they're only grave, grave clothes. And they keep you in bondage and they prevent you from living life to the fullest. They do. They're a life stopper. They're not a life giver. They're a life stopper. They only feed the flesh. But wait a minute. We already read that our old self was crucified with Christ. So we don't want to feed the flesh that was already crucified. The third thing I want you to see is the difference between the old self, the grave clothes, and the new life that we can have in Christ. There is a difference. You know, it's like the Lord says, I want you to wear this, but in order to wear that, you have to take off this. You know, you don't have clothes on and then put another outfit on over it, do you? I remember when I was young, though, when I was really small, I got kind of lazy. And I'd get out of bed and I'd have my pajamas on. I'd just put my clothes on over them. And I'd go out and play all day. That way, when I came home, I wouldn't have to put my pajamas on. I'd just take my clothes off and they were already on. But I was weird. But I mean, normally I grew up one day and I stopped doing that. About two years ago. So nobody like wears two outfits at the same time. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, here's a picture of the grave clothes, okay? You say, what's he talking about, grave clothes? Here is what the grave clothes are defined as, that if you don't take them off, you'll never live life to the fullest. And here they are. And by the way, it's what you had on before salvation, when you were spiritually dead. Colossians 3.8. But now you also put them all aside. Here they come. Anger. Put it aside. You know what anger is? Violent passion. Anger is like when it explodes and it poof. You can be angry and be self-controlled. This anger is a violent passion. It explodes. 
It's like, no control over it. That's the old grave clothes. Wrath, saying, take it off, put it aside. You know what the word wrath means? I love the original meaning of these Greek words. It means breathing hard like a bull. Anybody here ever do that? Come on. I was in a meeting one time with some people, and a man and a woman was there, and this lady was so angry. She was so angry, she started <gasps> breathing like a bull. <gasps> and it was like air was coming out of her nose and her mouth. <gasps> I'm like, whoa, I'm backing up. You know? And I'm saying, wow, that's it. That's anger. And I've seen it with my own eyes. It scared me. I'm glad she didn't have horns. I'd know what to do. But what does is, what is Paul say? Lay it aside. That's the old grave clothes. You're not going to do that and live life to the fullest. He said, put aside malice. Comes from the word mal, which means bad. Put aside badness. Nothing good comes from badness. Good only comes from goodness. You can tell because good is in the word. Bad, goodness. Put it aside. Slander. See, the sin nature loves these things. But that's the dead person that you used to be before you came alive in Christ. Slander is evil speaking. Oh, man, people love that one. They love to speak evil of other people. Somebody once said, there's two things that are bad for the heart. Running upstairs and running down people. No good. Badness is part of the old life. Evil speaking part of the grave clothes that we used to wear. Imagine how this would change the world if we put aside all these things. If we actually took these things off and eradicated them from our lives. He said, put aside abusive speech. That's filthy communication. Filthy communication. You know, we always want to represent our Lord and the way that we speak. There's no place for vile communication in the Christian life. Those are old grave clothes. These are the clothes that we had on before Christ made us new. But now he says, now that you're new, I want you to start removing. See, he doesn't remove them, we do. He makes us new, he brings us to life. But Jesus didn't unwrap Lazarus. He said, no, that's the job of people. Unwrap them. And he's not going to unwrap us. That's our responsibility to unwrap ourselves from these filthy garments that we wear. Some people are comfortable wearing their grave clothes after salvation. I said, some people are comfortable wearing their grave clothes after salvation. See, that's the thing with sin. You can actually do it so much, you really get comfortable with it. You get comfortable with malice, and you get comfortable with slander, and you get comfortable with sensuality, and you get comfortable with all these things that God is trying to free us from. He's trying to make us free. He's showing us, man, that, that is not living life to the fullest. So that's what it looks like when we wear those old clothes, but what does it look like when we put on the new clothes? New life in Christ. He gives us a robe of righteousness. And you know, the robe of righteousness, I believe, is exemplified by the fruit of the Spirit. What looks more attractive to you? What we just read that kind of defines the grave clothes, or what I'm going to read right now that would define the robe of righteousness. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, that sounds like that would make life more full and enjoyable. 
joy. That sounds pretty good. Uh, peace. Everybody wants peace, don't we? Love to go home to a house of peace. Love to go to work to a place of peace. Love to come to a church where we can find peace. Love to hang out with people that are peaceable people. We love peace. Matter of fact, I believe everything we do is to find peace. Whether it's working hard, buying things, going places, we're really looking for peace. That's what we're looking for. Kindness. This is what happens. This is what we put on. Imagine, we take off badness and we put on kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Faithfulness being devoted to Christ and to his word. And then gentleness. You know, gentleness means, it doesn't mean to be a doormat. You know what it really means? It means to not take something by force. Maybe gentleness is more along the lines of patience, being patient, learning how to wait. I know what I want, but if God doesn't give it to me, I'm not going to go get it, so I'm going to wait. Now, I'm not talking about a job. If you need a job, you go get one. Don't say, I'm waiting for God to give me a job. No, I'm talking about things that we know if we have to go get them the wrong way, then don't go get them the wrong way. Let God bring it if he so decides to give it to you. Gentleness is not taking things violently or by force. That's what that means. Self-control, that'd keep us out of trouble, wouldn't it? And I love the way Paul ended this. I'm going to read him again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. <laughs> so what he's saying is, if you live in these things, don't worry, you won't get arrested. You won't go to jail for being kind and being good and being faithful and having self-control and having peace and joy and love. Don't worry, it's not against the law to do those things. So it's not like, why are you so kind to them? You shouldn't be, you know, you could get arrested. No, that won't happen. So what's wrong with living that way? Let me ask you, which person looks more comfortable? The guy in the wrappings? The guy in the leisure suit? The girl in the leisure dress? Leisure outfit, leisure outfit? Which one looks more comfortable? And then ask yourself, oh, which way would I rather live? And which way am I living right now? Which one of those more depicts the way that you're living up until now? Because that's what we look like to God. So we have to ask ourselves, hmm, i got to make some decisions here. You mean I don't have to live in grave clothes anymore? No. You don't. You don't have to. You don't have to be stuck with those old practices and those old bad habits. You don't have to be in bondage and wondering if you'll ever be free. You can be free. You can be free. Take off the old. Put on the new. Paul said, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Man, we're halfway there. God has given us a new nature. He's made us a new creation. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the wisdom of his word. We've got all the tools that we need to remove all those wrappings that keep us in bondage, some kind of bondage. I bet all of us right now, if we took a couple of minutes, we could identify maybe one or two things that's in our life that's holding us back, that's hindering us from being totally, totally free. Totally free. Even free to worship God. There are bondages there. But sometimes people have a hard time worshiping. People have a hard time greeting church members. You know, we have a very small comfort zone. 
If you have a small comfort zone, by removing the grave clothes, you can widen that and have less things that frighten you and more things that you can enjoy. But a lot of folks, and maybe it's you, I don't know, maybe there are more things that frighten you than things that you enjoy. So what we do is we shut ourselves up in our own little world and we don't venture out. We don't stretch ourselves. We don't challenge ourselves. Why? Because we're wrapped up. The mummy returns. Right? Go home and watch The Mummy on Netflix. Watch The Mummy Returns. You can't get rid of him. Tough to get rid of that bugger. Bet you can do it. Because you got everything that you need. So finally, okay, how do I do it? I don't want you to just say, go do it. But God, you know, whatever God asks us to do, he always gives us instructions. So how do I do this? How do I take off the grave clothes so I can live life to the fullest? And I can live in this new life that God has given me. Well, God answers the question in Galatians 5.25. Watch how simple. If we live by the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In other words, if I have a spiritual relationship with God, I need to step up and I need to walk in it. I need to make it real. I need to make it practical. This is where it goes from being religious to lifestyle. You don't want to be a religious Christian. You, you want to be a Christian that's mocked out by your lifestyle, because that's freedom. That's freedom. Religion is not freedom. But a relationship with Christ is freedom. And our lifestyle will emanate that freedom. So we really need to identify those areas where I'm still wearing grave clothes and, and be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to pull us along. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to go there. I'm afraid. Really? After all that God did for us with his son on that cross, what is there ever to be afraid of? What reason would we have to fear when God has already demonstrated to us there's nothing to fear? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us power and a sound mind. He's given us everything that we need. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. But then he said, unbind him, remove the grave clothes, and let him go. Put your name there. Come forth. Norman, come forth. Shirley, come forth. Unbind him, unbind her. Take those grave clothes off and be free. Be free. Going to heaven is not God's complete plan for your life. It's being free while you're living this life on this earth. Free from anything that would stop you from expressing your love to God. Let's bow our heads. Oh, Father, we thank you that what you did with Lazarus is what you desire to do with all of us. I thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you've given us. But God, like Lazarus, help us to be free. Help us to walk in the Spirit and in newness of life so we can have total and complete freedom in this life as we're waiting to go to heaven. And now just in our closing moments, we're so thankful for everybody that comes to our church. And there's always people that come that might be beginning to look for God and wanting to get God in their life. And they hear a message about, believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. 
In this area, we grow up thinking that if we're just good enough, we'll be saved. But that's not Bible, because no one's good enough. You have to be perfect. But when you receive Christ as your Savior, you also receive His perfection. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you're not sure about your relationship with Christ, if you're not really certain that you have forgiveness and eternal life and a home in heaven, I'm going to pray a little prayer. And you can just follow along in your heart. That's all you have to do. It's a prayer of faith. And just say, yes, God, what he's saying, I'm in agreement with that. I'm praying that too in my heart. So I'm going to pray. Dear God in heaven, I know I need a Savior. And I believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior. I believe he's God and he came in the flesh. He became a man and he lived on the earth. And then he went to a cross and he shed his blood and covered all my sins. And he died and they buried him in a tomb. Oh, but three days later, he rose again. He conquered death, and he ascended into heaven, and now he sits at your right hand. So God, I'm coming to you today not based on who I am or anything I can do, but based on who Jesus is and what he did for me. Because of him, I ask you to forgive me, to save me. Amen.